Hello and welcome. Well, today's special guest doesn't really need much of an introduction. He is one of Australia's most trusted and respected parenting experts and thought leaders. Now, he is a man of great integrity, having set out on his career path uh, following struggles with his own family relationships and in his pursuit to learn how to be a better husband and father, he earned his first class honours and a subsequent PhD in psychology. Now he has since written six books, get ready for this. He's a four-time best-selling author. Um, he actually write, uh, he writes every now and then for the just the uh, the New York Times, if you've ever heard of them before. He's a TEDx speaker, a consultant to the Australian government's Raising Children Network and appears um, on a regular basis in all of Australia's major news outlets for television, radio and print. Oh, and of course, he's a busy dad, not to one, but to six daughters. Now, Dr. Justin Coulson, it's a great pleasure to be speaking with you today and thank you so much for joining us. How are you? It's great to be with you. Thanks, Rachel. Um, really, really nice to be able to have this conversation with you today. Fantastic. Now, there's a, uh, a great quote that when I read it, I actually thought of you. And um, the quote uh, says, you know, a person has two hands, one for helping himself and the other for help, uh, helping others. Uh, and you're a man of great virtue uh, who is passionate and driven by, by purpose. And it you're seems... Very the, uh, the focus of your life uh, is your family and then helping other families flourish and in that order. Um, so just to begin with, can you tell us uh, where your passion for helping others actually came from? Yeah, uh, years and years and years ago, I heard a quote that said, and, and, and look, it's a bit of a painful quote, a very sore point for some people. I, I want to acknowledge that before I share it. But the quote uh, really struck me because I was going through a painful moment with my family. Uh, it was something along the lines of no other success can compensate for failure in the home, which is pretty impactful. Uh, and at the time I was struggling as a dad. I had a couple of kids. Uh, my wife and I, uh, our relationship wasn't bad, but it definitely wasn't good. And the fact that I was struggling so much as a dad was creating pressure in our marital relationship as well, as these things kind of do. Uh, and, you know, I, I had a couple of really lousy experiences as a dad where I I mean, I was, a, I was a radio DJ. I had no formal education beyond high school. I certainly hadn't done any psychology studies or become a, you know, a, a parenting expert or gotten a PhD in psychology. Yeah. Uh, and so I'm just this sort of early to mid-20s dad with a couple of kids who uh, is getting frustrated because the darn kids won't do as they're told. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, well, at least the, ba the baby did because that was just a baby. Although, you know, babies can be pretty hard work as well when you don't know what to expect or you just want to get some peace and quiet and have a sleep uninterrupted. But the three-year-old, oh my goodness, she was just, <laughs> you, you know, right? You, you, you know what it's like. And I, I just treated her really, really badly a, a few times. Uh, and after one particular incident where I yelled and screamed and shouted and threatened and walloped and you know, carried on like I was the two-year-old rather than or the three-year-old rather than her. <laughs> it occurred to me that something needed to change. And the reality was it wasn't going to be my baby that changed. It needed to be me. I needed to act like an adult and like a father rather than a, a spoiled little three-year-old who was having a tantrum. Yeah. And so that, that led to a conversation with my wife about my radio career and what else I might do. And I suggested that we could pack it all up. We could throw it all in. We just had a brand new mortgage on our home and all that sort of thing. And I said, let's just, let's just see how we go. And I'm going to go back to school and study. And um, The best decision of your life. Best decision. Well, the best one decision was marrying the woman that I married. Of but course. <laughs> following, following that, one of the very best decisions I ever made. I spent eight and a half years as a full-time student, became a university lecturer and uh, academic uh, following my, my studies. But after a couple of years, I, I discovered a couple of things. I, you know, this journey by then had taken something in the order of I don't know, 10, 11, maybe 12 years. And it had just changed everything. You know, our family had grown and was thriving, flourishing. We, we'd I then had five children. Uh, of course, we've had a, a subsequent sixth one since then. And um, I just, I knew that what I'd learned had been at the core, at the very foundation of why my family was doing so well when we nearly lost it all. And I, I started teaching people and writing articles and talking about this stuff that had made my family so happy, these psychological principles, the science, the surprising science of family life that teaches us that exactly the very things that we think we should be doing are often the very thing we shouldn't be doing yeah. and there are things to do instead. Uh, I started teaching people that stuff and, you know, 
Rachel, the first time you share something with a couple who are struggling or a mum or a dad whose head is just being done in by this child who, you know, it, it's too much for them. And, and then they come to you a day later or a week later or a month later and say, I changed everything. Well, that's started happening. And it's pretty addictive when you, when you realize that you can share some information with somebody and they can go away and implement it in their lives. And all of a sudden, the thing that matters more than anything else, their, their relationships with the people who are the most important humans in their lives. When those relationships start to thrive and flourish, when your family feels connected, oh, gee, it's, it's incredible. So to have that kind of feedback, I, I went home from the university one day and said to my wife, that's, um, it. <laughs> that, that's it. I'm, I'm quitting again. I'm starting a new career. <laughs> And, she said, Again? <laughs> and, and that's, that's where it all happened. And that's why I do what I do. It, it, it I just can't think of anything else that you would more, want to do. More valuable. Yeah, yeah. Just wonderful. And you're one of the very few people in Australia with a PhD in positive uh, psychology and I'm the only person in the country and almost the world whose PhD includes a careful look at the intersection of positive psychology and relationships, meaning and purpose. Now, that's a lot for any normal person like me uh, to try to understand. Um, now, could you please unpack what that means in terms of how all that good stuff helps you help parents? Yeah, sure. Okay. So essentially, uh, well, let me, let me go back a step. Uh, when you go to uni, you normally do a, a degree uh, for, for anyone who's listening, who hasn't participated in uni at all. And uh, I, I mean, that was me until I was in my late twenties yeah. uh, that we call that an undergraduate degree because you haven't yet graduated. You're underneath graduation. So you're an undergrad, you get your degree and now you're a graduate. But once you finish your graduation and you can go and do other study like masters or a doctorate. And so I went and did a PhD, a doctorate, uh, which is another three years of, um, postgraduate study here in Australia. Uh, and then you've got this qualification to be called a doctor in the field that you've done your studies in. So that was essentially the journey that I went on. Uh, and the area that I studied was psychology for undergraduate because you, you don't have the option to do anything in positive psychology. But I was interested in what made people happy and what made relationships flourish and uh, you know, thrive. And so positive psychology is essentially the scientific study of the psychology of how we make life awesome. awesome. Now, that doesn't mean that, yeah, like we're not going to be 10 out of 10 all the time. And, uh, you know, even people who study positive psychology still have lousy days or, you know, lousy moments. That's, that's part of being a human. But, but there are some people who they just have higher levels of well being. You know, those people, Rachel, you meet them and they're always happy and they're always trying to make other people happy as well, which is really annoying if you don't want to be happy right now. Having a rough day. <laughs> I'm trying to make you happy. But, but I, I was fascinated by this idea of not so much happiness, but feeling well, you know, those people, when you meet them and they, you say, how are you going? And most people say, Oh, you're not bad. Every now and again, somebody will say, yeah, I'm good. Thanks. But every now and again, you meet somebody who says, Oh, I'm flaming unreal. Or they say, Oh, I'm 10 out of 10. Or they say, I'm, 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 I'm great. Thanks for asking. How are you? And you're like, Oh, I thought I was good till I met you. Gosh, you. <laughs> and you can see this energy and this enthusiasm, the vitality and vibrancy bouncing out of them, exuding from every pore. Yeah. And, and so while, while positive psychology isn't happyology, it's not about being stupidly happy and putting on a, a brave front. Positive psychology is about what makes life worth living and how we can get more of the good life. Uh, and, and particularly, uh, I, like you said, I'm one of the few people in the world who's actually looked at how positive psychology intersects with family life and parenting specifically, how we can make our families um, really feel like the kind of place that we want to be. Cause you know, sometimes we look at our family and we think, oh, am I really stuck with you? <laughs> like, could I just have somebody else's family instead? But I wanted to know when I was doing my study and I, I researched with about a thousand Australian families and I just found that there That's was a lot. handful of them. Not, not a lot. No, well, yeah, that is a lot, but there's not a lot of them that are really loving family life. Yes. A lot of families that are struggling. There's a lot of families that are having just Especially such a now. Oh, yeah. Well, I mean, in the context of, you know, post coronavirus Australia or, well, depending on which state you're in, obviously, because Victoria, hello. Um, uh, and we're in Victoria, so yeah, hello. <laughs> yeah, yeah, hello, Victoria. Come on, let's, let's get this going. Um, the, the, whole, the whole thing has really amplified and yeah. magnified a lot of challenges in families for many people. You know, the kids or the, the, the couple, uh, whoever it might be, it's, it's kind of tough. And so I'm, that, that's what I'm into. Like, how do we make our families 
quite literally happier. Yeah. It's an am- amazing legacy that you're building and, and just this life that you're creating. It's just, it's sensational. So congratulations on everything that you've achieved and are continuing to achieve. It's just, and it's all for the greater good. So just, you know, can't support and, and love any more what you're doing. Cause it is, it's just, it's creating a, a beautiful legacy and, and helping so many others. So, but today That's we're great. here actually to be making, um, well, cause you're, you're continuing to make a real difference for families and you've partnered with big W for toy mania 20, 2020 as their play expert, um, yeah. which sounds pretty fun. I've got to, got to say to you, he's play expert. Now, I've got lots of questions about the power of play. And um, to, like, to begin with, I'd love to know, you know, from your perspective, like, you know, what is the importance of toys and how can they be you know, incorporated into playtime, I guess, to entertain and assist with children's just overall development? Yeah, so so toys, uh, some people poo-poo toys. They're like, ah, oh, kids don't need toys. They just need to go out and play and pick up a stick and that's good enough. Or, you know, they, they can do all sorts of things with sticks and with leaves and just let them play with the cardboard box. And, you know, there's 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 some truth to that but research actually shows that playing with toys is really great for kids and their development they learn social skills they learn to solve problems they learn to use their creativity and their imagination they learn to follow rules they learn to get along with others especially their siblings when they're you know fighting with each other and you know you you didn't roll a six you rolled a four you just cheated i saw you move the dice or uh, you know (laughs) when you're playing uno with 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 your siblings and they put down a draw four and you draw four, and then they put down another draw four. And you're like, <laughs> There's nothing worse oh, than that. <laughs> you know, and, and you watch your eight-year-old or your just me. build down over this. So, uh, you know, <laughs> what, what the great thing about toys is is it teaches it teaches so much. The social stuff it teaches. Um, it teaches young children when they're playing with, you know, like their Fisher Price stuff or their Play-Doh, they learn how to manipulate things with their hands, their gross motor skills, their, their physical capacity can grow. I mean, there's just, there's so many different ways we could go. So where do you want to go first? And let's play, literally, let's play with these ideas. Yeah. Well, I mean, as we know, like toys encourage, you know, imagination and creativity, and they also provide opportunities for a whole heap of different cognitive and social development. But can you expand on this just a little bit, um, possibly with some like real life examples? Um, maybe, if, I don't know, if you wanted to. <laughs> Heck yeah, let's do it. Okay. So let's, <laughs> let's talk first of all about, um, well, I, I kind of gave a couple of examples with social relationships already. Okay. So, uh, Playing any kind of play, whether it's in a cubby house or on the monkey bars, or whether it's the wet with the Lego or playing Uno, you know, there's there's going to be this kind of, from a social point of view, if you're with another person, you have to learn how to cooperate and collaborate. Yeah. Even if you're playing a competitive game. Now, I'm not a huge fan of competition, especially for children. I don't think that it's in their best interest most of the time. Uh, they don't tend to do too well with it. But you know what, sometimes it's part of life and it's important that they at least understand what it is uh, and and how to get along with others. And so when we're in all these sorts of situations, whether it's a competitive game, you know, there's, there's literally, we're playing a game and there's going to be a winner or whether they're playing, Oh, you know what I've right here in my office, all the kids have gotten some toys from big W, but I got one myself. Oh, cool. Look at that. (laughs) <laughs> so this is this is the ultimate Nerf gun, right? It's, it, it holds fifty Nerf darts, and uh, and I'm going to win every Nerf war that our family has. Now, I've, I've, I'm not into guns, and I'm not into shoot 'em up sort of games. But when you discover the joy that comes from having either a water pistol fight or a Nerf war, it, it just it softens your opinion. Just. <laughs> It's so much fun. So what do you think parents can then incorporate, I guess, or in, introduce into playtime that can help with their kids' skill development and or problem solving? Do you have any examples at all? Yeah, well, well, I think, I think the most important thing is that, I mean, let's, let's, just, let's just stick with the Nerf thing for a minute. There's, if you're going to have a Nerf war, <laughs> somebody's, somebody's going to win and somebody's going to lose. Somebody's going to get hit by the, the Nerf darts and somebody's not. Uh, and, and so what, what we're really doing is we're teaching the kids how to play together in challenging circumstances. Now, again, I'm not huge on putting the, pitting the kids against each other and playing my own little version of hunger games with them and seeing who survives at the end. But regardless of what we're doing, we're problem solving, we're being creative, we're having social interactions. And, and to, to your later question just now, we don't really need to introduce anything other than, some kind of stimulus that is the toy 
and perhaps somebody to play with. Not always, because there's plenty of toys that are great for solo play as well. But whether it's solo or with another person, our children will learn. In fact, a, a colleague of mine at the University of New South Wales, her name is uh, Dr. Amy Graham, and she found that not only do toys help with you know the social stuff and the problem solving and the imagination and creativity and all the things that we've already been discussing, toys also help our young children to become uh, what 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 researchers call school ready. So she found that children who had uh, a, a decent array of toys to play with, I think in her research, there were 29 different toys that they asked about. And kids that had access to a range of those toys showed up at school and were better prepared to be at school. And I think it's because parents don't have to buy the latest educational game. They don't have to get download the latest educational app and they don't have to introduce things into the environment beyond just having some stuff to play with and having someone to share it with. That seems to be it. On that, because as we know, like loose parts play is messy and it's chaotic. So on that, you know, like so we have things around the house that we can sort of introduce for kids to be able to play with. And, it, and we all know that there's, it, it's hugely beneficial and it inspires innovation and creativity. Um, and loose parts play can also improve concentration and problem solving skills and do all the wonderful stuff. And it does actually help them to thrive in a versatile environment and um, that they have complete ownership of, but I'd love to know what your your personal thoughts are on the benefits of lo loose parts play. Um, in that, in uh, I guess following on from your comment that that we don't always necessarily have to go out and, and have lots of toys to be able to um, provide all these this, 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 these beneficial benefits you know, like to play, I guess. Yeah, uh, well, well, the loose parts offers a level of creativity that a toy sometimes doesn't. Uh, because toys are sometimes confined. Now, I'm I'm all for, uh, say, the Littlest Pet Shops or the Sylvanian Families or the you yes. know the Woody doll and the Jessie doll. Um, but what you'll usually find, or or Elsa and Anna from Frozen and and Olaf. I mean, for goodness sakes, I've got six daughters. You know, <laughs> I can <quite> imagine. <laughs> Frozen, hello. Uh, all, all of those kinds of toys, uh, they can be used in any number of ways, and kids will use them in any number of ways. They'll be creative with them and do all sorts of fun things with them. There's value in them, but there's also value in just opening up the Tupperware cupboard and the second drawer in the kitchen and saying, I wonder what you want to play with today. You know, that, that kind of idea or just finding stuff, you know, the stick in the backyard or the cardboard box that you um, had that package arrive in yesterday can become a, a delightful uh, thing to play with, especially if you can, join the cardboard box with the stick and grab some scissors and some tape. Uh, one of my six-year-old daughter's favorite things to do is just get stuff out of the recycling bin and get some sticky tape and some staples uh, and a staple stapler. Uh, and, and, and my goodness, she just, she just creates stuff. And then she takes all of those loose parts that she's created and takes them over to her box of littlest pet shops or her box of, um, you know, Anna and Elsa and the frozen dolls or whatever it might be or her Lego uh, table. And, and she incorporates all the loose parts with the toys that we've purchased. Yes. I mean, even, even our Lego has become a loose parts toy depot. If yes, you will, because, very much you know, so. You buy, you buy Lego and you pay an absolute fortune so that you can build this kit and do that thing. And, and all of a sudden, you know, three days later, you look for the Lego that you've just spent all that money on and it's been built and then pulled down and thrown into the big Lego tub with everything else. And you're like, Oh, I guess we're never going to build that. Item. <laughs> it just becomes part of the whole Lego conglomeration. And then they start building all these amazing things where you've got Harry Potter, who's hanging out with, um, I don't know, whichever Disney character is the latest Lego thing, you know, like, you know, they just mix and match and the kids don't care. And, and for me, that's good enough. And, and, and talking about like your daughter sort of playing with it, all the bits and pieces from the recycling bin. You now, do you think that um, there's importance in promoting autonomy in play? Um, and if so, why, I guess? Such an important question. I'm really delighted that you asked that question. So some researchers that I've been following for a number of years now did a, a fascinating study. I reckon it must have been nearly 20 years ago. Could have even been a touch more. And what they did was they, they got uh, parents of toddlers, two and three-year-olds, and they put them into the, the, the lab with their toddler and said, play with them with this. And they gave them a, a toy that was a little bit complicated. It had all sorts of different 
features and things that it could do. You know, the Fisher Price things where you can spin yes. and you can tap and you can, you know, things pop up and you pop them back down and that kind of thing. It wasn't one of those, but it was, it was that kind of idea. There were all sorts of things that this toddler could push and poke and prod and play with to make the toy do different things. And the researchers simply observed mum with child. And what they discovered was that when mum was kind of, I guess, autonomy supportive, that is mum was engaged in the play, but completely non-controlling. Mum let the toddler guide him or herself through the toy and figure things out on their own. And when something exciting happened and the toddler went, Oh, and the mum would go, Oh, and you know, like, so there was, there was feedback and there was reciprocity and there was, there was playing together happening, but the toddler was really in charge of the play with mum being a support. And then there were other mums who were, I guess, I guess, you know, the kind of parent that I, I might be, or that you might be, you know, we get a bit excited and we want to step in and we want to show them how everything works. And so you play with it like this and you push that and look, well, look what happened. And that, so they, they were essentially grouped into autonomy supportive mums and controlling mums uh, with no judgment. I know that that sounds a little bit icky when you say it like that, but you know, that that's what the categorization was. Yeah. And what the researchers found was, oh, and by the way, they brought them back into the lab a couple of weeks later to play with the same toy and to play with other toys. And the researchers found that in the moment, the toddlers whose parents were more controlling tended to play a little less with the toy. They had a little bit less motivation, a little bit less perseverance. I guess they just had a little bit less interest because they weren't ex experiencing that process of play and discovery for themselves. They were experiencing it with a mum who was a little controlling. Why? Well, because mum wants the best things for her kids and mum wants her kids to do well. And I mean, this is a psychology study. We need to show them and that you know how to play with the toy. I don't know what was going on, but yeah. mums want their children to look smart and do really, really well. The, so, so, parents, the yeah. parents who were autonomy supportive, though, they had kids who were much more likely to persevere, much more likely to figure things out for themselves. And this is the, this is the key. When those kids were brought back into the lab a couple of weeks later, those children, the children of the mums who were supportive of autonomy, they were engaged, but they were not controlling. Those kids were much more excited to play with the toys, especially the toy that they'd been given, but they were interested in exploring and being creative. Like there, there was just such a, there was a significant difference in the way that they wanted to engage with the play and the toy compared to the ones who had parents who were just that little bit more involved, over-involved, controlling, showing them how to do it even with the best of intentions. So there definitely are benefits in parents playing with their kids. It's just a matter of how much they sort of interact with them throughout the playing process. Would that be right? I'd, I'd, I'd just shift a little bit of the words that you've said there a touch. It's definitely important that we're playing with them, but it's important that to the extent that it's reasonable, we let them take the lead. Yes. We support them in their expressions of creativity and imagination and interest. Now, a quick caveat here. Sometimes as a parent, you just have to say, oh, for goodness sakes, I've had enough. <laughs> like, I mean, it's exhausting playing with kids, right? Sometimes you just don't really want to go and play that stupid game again. It's really <laughs> frustrating because uh, let, you know, let, let's be real. Sometimes we're tired. Sometimes we've got other things to do. Sometimes we don't want to have to be that character in this story again. Again. Uh, again and again and again. So if that's the case, what we do sometimes do as parents is we need to step back and say, you know what, uh, I'm not playing that game. Um, I'm going to take a little bit of control here and there. And that is okay from time to time. I don't want parents to hear this conversation and think, oh, well, I've just got to always be there and always be enthusiastic and always be supportive. Nobody's that perfect. <laughs> Nobody wears a halo all day, every day. Do the best that you can. But wherever you can, let your children guide their exploration. Let your children be the ones who are developing the creative ideas. Let your children feel your support to the extent that that's reasonable and, and, and doable for you. Oh, that's wonderful. Now, a bit of a shift of pace just for a moment. Um, I've, I've got one word for you, and I'd love to know your thoughts on the features and benefits. So here it comes. Are you ready? Screen time. Uh, a penny okay. for your thoughts, sir. That's, that's two words. I'm sure that's two words. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So uh, let, let me be really, really clear about what the research says here. Now, before I share where I'm going with this in the last couple of weeks for my own podcast, I've interviewed uh, 
at least three or four experts from around the world uh, who have spent the last decade or more investigating the way that screens impact mm. on well-being and development for our children. Okay, so what I'm going to share with you is really based on literally cutting-edge research. In fact, just yesterday I was talking to uh, a phenomenal researcher who's made this his life's work, uh, who really talked me through a whole lot of ideas that I thought were, were brilliant. So let's let's go through this. First of all, for children who are young, we definitely want to minimize it. And the main reason is because with screen time, there's, it's kind of a mutually exclusive proposition, right? If you're on your screen, you're not being physically active. You're not interacting with other people unless you're chatting with grandma on FaceTime or, you know, yes. uh, face chat or whatever it is we're going to call it. Um, <laughs> You, you're not uh, using your body and developing those gross and fine motor skills. You're not being particularly creative or imaginative because the screen is doing all of that work for you. Yes. You're, you're not using your brain and your body in the same ways that you would if the screen were off. Yes. So there is an opportunity cost with screen time. Does that mean that we shouldn't have it and our children should stay away from it? No, it doesn't mean that at all. What it does mean though is that we need to make sure that we've got plenty of scope for our children to have a whole and balanced life. Mm. So the way, I, the way I talk about it is uh, there are three C's around screen time. Well, actually there are six, but I'm just going to talk about three in this conversation. There's creation, there's consumption, and there's connection. So if our children, regardless of their age, in fact, even for us as adults, if we can use our screens for creation and connection, more than we use them for consumption, then we're probably doing okay. You know, this conversation right now, Rachel, we're using screens, but we're using it for creation and we're using it for connection. Yes. And we're not going to be any worse off because of this conversation. In fact, we'll probably be better off. You know, this has been a, a, a creative connecting experience and that's positive. That's great. Mm. Similarly, I, I'm just working my way through a TV program on Apple TV. Uh, cool. Called, it's called Dad's. And it's a documentary about being a dad. Uh, now that's consumption, but there's a there's an element of growth and learning. And uh, while I'm not connecting or creating, I'm certainly not idly consuming. But you know what? At the moment, we've got a couple of teenagers, and um, well, we've got you know, six kids, as you know. But two of them are in their teens, and we've been talking to them a little bit about how much fun we used to have watching all the Mission Impossible and Jason Bourne movies. And the kids <laughs> were like, "Well, well, we haven't seen them." And so we're going through, you know, every couple of nights, we're watching another Mission Impossible movie. Yeah, and that is pure consumption. Except there's a little bit of connection, right? Because the kids are laughing and they're going, oh, this is so lame. Or, oh, that was awesome or whatever, <laughs> whatever it might be. And so, you know, I think that we want to be really intentional about the way we use our screens. Am I going to say we shouldn't be using them? No way. What I will say, though, is minimize consumption, maximize creation and connection, and make sure that your kids have got time to do all the other things in life that matter. If they're yes. little kids, then there may not be a whole lot more other than just be little kids, be outside digging in the sand pit or playing with the water play or, you know, get your little kids to make you another Play-Doh pie. Uh, you, you know, how many times have you picked up the Play-Doh that they've turned into a meal and you go nom, 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 and pretend to eat the Play-Doh? <laughs> it's that sort of stuff really matters. It matters yes. so much more than staring at a screen. But if you haven't been able to have a shower for three days because your toddler will not leave your side unless there's a screen and you've decided no screens, you know, and, and even, you know, they follow you into the toilet, hanging onto your leg and you're like, oh my goodness, put, the, put them in front of the iPad, turn on ABC Kids, do something so that you can yeah. have some people, cook your meal without having this child constantly at you. I, I, again, I think we've got to be real about it. A screen's good or bad? Yeah, yes and no, and both. Depends how you're using them. Yes. And I'm sure you're familiar, there was a Dell Technologies report um, that came out a little while ago that stated that 85% of the jobs in 2030 um, that Generation uh, Z and Alpha will, um, will enter into haven't been like, even invented yet. So getting back to screens and to technology, you know, in your opinion, do you think that screens will still be the way of the future? And do you think that technology provides you know, kids of this generation with a greater chance to pursue maybe a wider selection of career opportunities um, later on in life um, and in their career? 
or not. I don't know what was mm. your personal thoughts on that. You know what? I mean, there are some kids that are going to live their lives on screens and some who won't. I think that if we're talking about helping our children to become familiar with screens so that they can have tech related jobs as they get older, because screens are the way of the future. Yeah. I'm not so big on that. I mean, I reckon giving your child an iPad and saying, here, learn how to use this, uh, you know, learn how to play on this, learn how to watch stuff on this, learn how to chat with people on this and then expecting that they're going to become a Silicon Valley entrepreneur is kind of like giving your kids a Tonka truck and saying, I think you're going to become a mechanic. You know, I mean, there's, when your kids are playing with a laptop or the desktop or the, the phone or the, the, the tablet, they're not really learning anything about screens. And anybody, even grandparents and great-grandparents, can learn how to figure out an iPad in about five minutes. Yes. So if, they, if they're going to have a screen-based career, they'll work that out for themselves by the time they get to about grade 10 or grade 12 or once they're in university or whatever it might be. I don't think that we need to be sticking screens in front of our kids so that they can learn how to become screen experts. Not necessary. They'll, they'll work that out when they get older. But if we're using screens to facilitate um, connection and creation uh, or even to have a little bit of downtime and a little bit of consumption, yeah, that, that's okay. So video games would fall into the um, category of consumption naturally. As well. well, yes, yes, and no. This is where it gets complicated, Rachel. I hate to say this to you, but <laughs> video games, video games can be incredible for creation. I mean, look at Minecraft yes. and look at Roblox. You know, they, they, and there are so many others as well. They're just two of the most popular ones. Uh, there's extraordinary. I, I mean, look at uh, Fortnite. Fortnite's all yes. about building and and creation. Uh, that's part of the game. It's about creation, uh, and most of these games offer fairly substantial levels of connection depending on how you've got your settings organized yes. um, once your kids are in the upper grades of primary school and certainly in high school if they're gaming they're certainly connecting around the gaming so you've got a whole lot of consumption going on but there's plenty of creation and oodles of connection in fact if your kids aren't playing that game they go to school tomorrow and they feel like they're left out and they're not connecting with anybody because they're they're losers right like nobody i'm not going to play the game that everyone else is playing i'm the only one like you know, <laughs> if you know if you're always the only one um and and so so this makes it very very important for us as parents to be judicious and discerning in the way that we uh facilitate their access to this stuff we want to make sure that they're not being exposed. And, and, you know, I mentioned that there were six C's, but I was only going to talk about three. So the three other keys, uh, the three other C's, sorry, are the content, the context, and your child. So the content is, is the big one that I want to talk about here, but I'll also mention context. The content is what are they actually looking at? What are they actually playing? And, you know, there's some stuff out there that your kids shouldn't be watching or playing or engaging with or interacting with. And even if the game's okay, who else is on the game that they might be connecting with and that person is then providing content in the game that's making the game go from being completely safe and fun and friendly to being extraordinarily dangerous, risky uh, and inappropriate for your children to be accessing. Yes. The context relates to when and where. So, you know, it's not okay to have your screen at the dinner table. It's not okay to have screens in the bedroom. That, that's the context. And, oh, you know, it's not okay to be staring at a screen when you've got your friend over. Get on your bike. Go for a ride down the park. Yes. <laughs> and, and your child, well, different children have different needs. So if you've got a child who's on the spectrum or if you've got a child who's really introverted or if you've got a child who's having a couple of lousy days and is, is not feeling well and the doctor said, take the rest of the week off school, then you're going you're gonna to change up their, their screen diet based on all of those kinds of considerations. I don't know if I've just muddied the water for you. Even no, more. not at all. Not at all. And you know, really highlighted the video games um, can d definitely help encourage problem solving skills. That's for sure. Um, but you know, I guess another flip side to, to, to screens and, and video games is that too much of that can sort of can be damaging to children's sleep and their focus overall. Um, and I've just noticed, and, and the games you were just mentioning before and Fortnite being one of them, you know, they, they're so fast paced and they're so highly adrenalized as well. And so, which sort of brings us sort of full circle now back to sort of, to just like playtime um, with toys and, and that sort of stuff also where, you know, we're, we're away from screens and away from all of that sort of stuff. So I'd love to know, you know, but from your point of view, what, like what, what tips do you have, I guess, and um, how parents can keep, um, you know, their children more engaged with toys um, and have them indulge, I guess, in more playtime away from screens? Well, there's probably just a handful of things that I'd run by you uh, when, when it comes to this. First of all, you want to make sure that there's at least a space in the house 
where the kids have got their toys and they can play comfortably and they're allowed to make a little bit of a mess and it's not going to freak everybody out. Uh, you know, when, when you look at the kids at uh, preschool, for example, uh, they've always got the, they've got the reading corner and they've got the uh, yeah. water play corner and they've got, they've got different corners for different kinds yeah. of play. Yeah. Now, obviously yeah. that's not going to be doable for everybody in every home. That might be a bit of a challenge, but we can probably organize a play space in most of our homes for our children. In fact, I would say that that's really important. They need to have a place that they can call theirs, that they can have that, that fun. The next thing that I'd say is you want to minimize access to screens because that way you, your kids are going to engage in other stuff. You know, if, if the screen is invisible, then it's not going to be a temptation. So put screens away, hide them, put them behind a closet or, you know, charge them in a drawer away from the main living area where everyone's going to have access to them and keep on going and grabbing it and staring at it again. Uh, the, the third point that I'd make is that we should play with our kids. We want to get down on the ground and wrestle with them. We want to see what they're building and see if we can join in, let them take the lead as much as possible, but absolutely join in and be a part of their play. And, and I think, just provide them with resources, make sure that they've got them, you know, go and buy, buy the Lego. Um, big W has got a big sale on it right now with toy. <laughs> or go and, go and, go, go and buy a couple of toys. You can, you can actually buy toys pretty darn cheap. Uh, and, and they provide an extraordinary amount of delight and joy and happiness. And on that, I mean, oh, to be a child in this generation with, you know, the opportunity to have choice of so many toys and generally kids do have so many of them. And I'd love to know from your point of view, you know, are there any cognitive benefits, um, I guess, on children having toys on rotation? Um, and if so, like what, what are the benefits? Yeah, I don't know if there's so much cognitive benefits. I mean, I guess there is because with, with novelty and with something coming in and then going out, uh, that, that, that provides that opportunity for new ideas, new growth, new play, new, new scenarios. So mm. I, I guess, I, I don't know that I'd be able to quantify it and put a number on it, but yeah, you, you know, have the toys out and then swap them around when you notice that the kids aren't playing with them. Don't sort of say, well, you've got one week with this and then we don't, don't be so rigid that it's just one week on one week off with the toys, but go by their signals, be guided by them. Uh, again, this is where the autonomy support comes in. Look at them and say, eh, you haven't really played with your toys much lately. And they're like, oh, I'm bored with my toys. Oh, well, why don't we swap them out and we'll put some of, some of these new ones in or we'll, you know, swap in some of your favorites and we'll mix it all up and get them going again. And I mean, that's, that's the kind of thing that really keeps them engaged, right? And keeps them inspired in new engagement of play, I guess, overall. There's, oh, I've forgotten about this. And then, you know, maybe they have developed in different ways and they see that toy differently maybe yeah. as well. Um, but I guess for a parent that hasn't possibly heard of um, the term open-ended play experiences or possibly knows what it is, could you maybe just explain uh, just briefly? Yeah, yeah. So uh, let, let me start with closed kind of things. So if you're playing on an iPad, quite often, you, you know, you, let's say it's a choose your own adventure. Uh, yep. That sounds yep. open-ended, but essentially you're choosing between option A and option B, and that's all you can do. It's it's clearly defined. If you're playing snakes and ladders, you're you're going along the board. If you're playing Monopoly, you're going around the board and you're doing what the dice say and you're following the rules. That's what um, that's what a lot of play is, and it's it's kind of closed. Open-ended means that it can go anywhere and it can do anything. It's literally choose your own adventure because there is no script, there are no rules. It's like the great big Lego bucket. What do you want to build today? You can build anything. <laughs> It's like getting into the sand pit. What, what do you want to shape or sculpt today? Because you can do whatever you want. That's, that's open-ended. It's like picking up the characters from the Lilith's Pet Shop or the, the, the Anna and Elsa doll or whoever it might be and saying, well, today Anna's going to go on an adventure. Yes. And then off yes. she goes and, and, and you literally, your child imaginates their own adventure. I don't know if imaginates a word, but I, I'm going to use it anyway. <laughs> So there's, I guess with open-ended play, there's no right way to get to the end because there's no end. It's like, or problem solving. Is that what it is? Yeah. Yeah. Well, problem solving often comes up in open-ended play, but problem solving is a little bit different. Problem solving is where you're trying to achieve a certain end and there's an obstacle in the way and you've got to work out how to get around that obstacle. So maybe you're, you're playing with the Lego or you're playing with the Duplo or you're playing with the Play-Doh and you decide that you want to build a, a castle or a bridge or a whatever it might be. Maybe you're doing an arched door and you realize, hang on, Lego doesn't really have arches so much. How am I going to do this? I know I can, I can formulate them in this way and that way I can have 
the kind of effect that I'm looking for. And so there's problem solving involved in the open-endedness of what that Lego play or that Play-Doh play or that open-ended play might be. So these are the types kinds of games that encourage positive social interaction with others um, or creative and imaginative play. So things like you mentioned, like Duplo, Lego, um, Play-Doh, then pro uh, provide, guess, an open-ended play experience. Would that be right? Yeah, and I think that's why those toys have lasted so long. I mean, these are the toys that we grew up with and some of our parents were even playing with them when they were kids. These toys have been around for so long because they are, they're, they're basic. Yes. And basic is best you know, because it's open-ended and because if it's open-ended, there are going to be problems that need to be solved and uh, imagination and creativity will reign supreme when you've got this open-ended play and, and it can be done on your own. You know, your child can totally play completely on their own with this stuff or they can play with a sibling or they can play with a friend. That's, that's what makes these so versatile and so good. Yeah. And look, could you maybe just talk to us a little bit about gender typed toys? Um, we've seen some really positive developments in recent years um, in the advancement towards diversity. Um, but in your opinion, are gender typed toys um, less supportive in encouraging optimal development uh, for children? And if so, why, I guess? Mm, it's, a, it's a really interesting question. So some people, when they hear a question like this, they roll their eyes and go, oh, for goodness sake. Here we go again. Yeah. And, and then there are other people who will be like, oh, no, no, this is, this is the way of the future. You know, we need to strip gender out of toys. You know, it's such a polarizing topic. So here's what we know. We know that when we give boys and girls a choice, even when they're very young, before they've been deeply indoctrinated with gender stereotypes, boys tend to manipulate toys even feminized dolls and you know girl, girls toys if i can use that term so loosely boys tend to if that's all they've got to play with they tend to play with those toys but they tend to play with them in more masculine kind of ways more stereotypically masculine ways so they'll they'll get the dolls punching each other up or they'll whack the dolls against the wall or against each other or they'll turn the doll into a gun and go choo 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 with the doll's leg uh, now that do they all do that of course not yeah. but but on average they're more likely to do that then treat them the way they're supposed to be treated. And, you know, and girls tend to be much more relational in the way that they play. So whether we want to or not, there is a difference in the way that girls and boys play, even with toys that are designed for one gender or another. It, it simply exists and it's very, very hard to argue against it. Is it nature or nurture? We don't know because, you know what, by the time they're three or four, children have been socialised into a certain way of being as a boy or a girl in the most part. Having said all of that, there's also some pretty cool research. Uh, Sarah Coyne, who I just interviewed for my podcast recently, uh, Sarah Coyne is at Brigham Young University in the United States, and she's been doing this research looking at uh, the way media and toys affect the way children play. Yes, and what their what their what their ideas are, what their values are, the way they interact with one another, and what Sarah's research and others has found is that um, when children are playing with hyper masculine hyper masculine toys, and mainly it's boys that will play with them, they do tend to adhere to more stringent gender stereotypes around masculinity. They also tend to be a little bit more aggressive. They tend to fit that male dominance stereotype more. And similarly, girls, when they play with more hyper-feminized girls' toys, whether they're playing in the kitchen or whether they're playing with the Barbie dolls or they're playing with the stuff that really emphasizes femininity and the stereotype of Fem femininity those girls do tend to see fewer possibilities for themselves in their future they That's tend to adhere much more strongly to feminized stereotypes particularly the much more conservative ones and so yeah, i mean it's fascinating the way this works my advice around this is have an array of toys in the home for the children to select and try to the extent that it's reasonable i mean don't be over the top about it but to the extent that it's reasonable, try to minimise kids' exposure to the stuff that's really obviously feminised or masculinised. Um, now, a quick reality check around this. I tried so hard to not have any certain dolls in my house. I mean, I just tried so hard. A house but my, kids, dolls. my kids begged for them. 
they just wanted them. I mean, I've got six girls and they, they're girls and they want to play with toys that they perceived to be girly. And so we eventually cracked and caved and the pressure got too much and we bought them a couple of those things and, you know, they love playing with them. They have an absolute ball with them. They're meaningful and they get to have all of the positive impacts of play. Our role, therefore, as parents is to help them to enjoy that play experience, but also to make sure that we're giving them the opportunities that they might not realise that they want now, but they might want later so that they can not be not be susceptible or not be as susceptible to the potential negative flow ons of playing with what might be considered a hyper feminized uh, girl's toy. That's, that's really fascinating. Um, and following on from that a little bit, you know, with regards to parents providing op- opportunities and resources for, for, for children through toys, do you believe that basic um, is best? Um, and yeah. if so, why? Yeah, I- I mentioned that before and and it really ties in with that whole idea of open-endedness and being able to do whatever you want, making up your own rules and being creative and bringing other people in. The the more complex it is, the more uh, buttons to push and the more whistles and pops and, uh, you know, the more sound effects and the, the, the more that the iPad tells you what you have to do, the less your children have the capacity to do all of the good things that great toys facilitate for them. Yeah, and so do you think that children need um, access to a whole wide variety of different toys in order to stimulate their growing minds or not? Yeah, once again, the research would suggest that so long as, the, so long as your kids have got access to a reasonable, it doesn't have to be massive, it doesn't have to be an entire toy store. I mean, when my kids got the, the Toy Mania catalogue, they went through with the texter and they just coloured everything. They're like, I want that, I want that. You know, they were circling every toy in the catalogue. I'm like, we're not going to buy the entire store. You can have two things each or one thing each or whatever. So long as they've got a handful of things that they can play with, uh, I, I think that's, that's enough. We just want to make sure that they've got a little bit of variety uh, and give them some autonomy in that selection, but also as parents, make some wise choices around what you know is going to be good for them. And if there's a good balance between the two, so they've got some stuff that they've chosen and some stuff that you know is going to be beneficial, they'll be okay. Yeah. Well, on that and back to Big W and the catalogue, you know, what do you think are the best buys, I guess, at the Big W Toy Mania sale? Um, And how do they aid, um, I guess, you know, um, certain sort of child development in all of the good stuff that we've just been talking about? (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. So I'm, I'm actually, I'm I'm going to avoid the question. I'm going to be a little bit political. Yeah. I'm going to, I'm going to use my best (laughs) politician voice here and say, oh no, it's not for me to suggest which are the best bo- best buys. The best buys are the ones that are going to fall in line with what you value as a family, uh, fall in line with the rules and ideas and principles that we've shared in this conversation and that also meet your children's desire for, you know, ha- having something fun to play with. And I'll give you an example of what I mean. Uh, when my kids had the opportunity to choose a couple of toys, they invariably chose stuff that doesn't fit within the guidelines that are important to me. I mean, they're, they're just, they're kids, right? They just want the really fun stuff, the whiz bang, woohoo kind of stuff. Uh, and I wasn't real wrapped with that. And so what we did was we worked out a bit of this and a bit of that, and it's all come out in the wash pretty well. But you know, my six year old, the toy that she chose, I can't actually remember what it's called, but it is not educational. It is, <laughs> not uh, open-ended it is not any of the you know it's not going to encourage positive social interaction it's it doesn't do any of that stuff in fact when the kids opened all of their toys within half an hour they were fighting because i want to play with that one no that's mine you know it was all that sort of stuff and she won't play with me and she wants to play this and i want to play this it was just chaos i was like oh why, why, why do we even get these toys but you know within a little while they they worked it all out and then they started playing and we had a happy family again but i think we the, the rule is talk to the kids about it, work out what's going to work for them, what they're excited about. And then if there's absolutely no overlap, you might say, well, let's come up with some other ideas together. You can have one of these, but let's also get one of these because we know that it's going to be valuable for you. And in that, um, given that you've, you've got so, you know, six children all playing together, is there any examples of toys that are great for children of all ages to grasp the con- com- concept of like playing together at all? Um, would Lego and, or Lego Friends maybe be an example of that? Or are there any others that come to mind at all? 
Yes and no. I mean, if every family, every child, every circumstance is going to be different. And what might work in my family might not work so well in another family. I mean, and, and consider the spread that I've got, right? So my eldest actually moved out now. She wasn't part of the conversation, uh, but I've got one who's in year 12, one who's in year 10, one who's in year seven, one who's in year five, and one who's in her first year of school this year. And so the, the year 12 and year 10 kids, they're not really that interested in playing what the six-year-old wants to play. Of course. In fact, of neither, course. neither are the 10 or the 12 year old. The six year old's sort of, you know, out, out here on her own and everyone says, you know, I won't play with me. You know, it gets pretty chaotic. The big kids, they tend to want to play totally different games and be involved in totally different activities. And so as a family, we sit down and we work it out and we do what works for everyone. And it might mean that we say to the big kids, guys, we want you to sacrifice for the next 10 or 15 minutes and do something that's just going to be like pulling teeth. But in 15 or 20 minutes, they'll have had their game. And then we'll have a game with you and they can go and do something else, you know, stick it in front of the iPad. They can play an educational app <laughs> because we, we just want, we want to make sure that everybody feels engaged and involved and feels important. And now we were speaking um, so much before about open-ended uh, play experiences. Um, what are some examples from the sale, I guess, of open-ended toys? Um, would Lego and Play-Doh, Play -Doh, I think we mentioned Duplo yeah. and some yeah, outdoor yeah. play dolls, action figures. Is that all open-ended play? That's exactly what those things are. Precisely. Yeah. The, the dolls, the action figures, the outdoor play, of course, uh, and, and those things where there's, there's just not necessarily any rules. It's just an activity. That's the sort of stuff that we're talking about. Yeah. So Lego, Play-Doh, Duplo, outdoor play, action figures. And then earlier we were talking about when parents describe uh, their children's play um, and, and play with their children, that can encourage open-ended, imaginative um, uh, sort of play experiences and creative expression overall. Um, so what sort of toys are good for helping um, parents, I guess, sort of get down and, and, and to play with their kids? So is Play-Doh one of them and crafts maybe as well? Um, is yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly the same kinds of things again. And, and it, it's great if you're playing with the toys, but you don't always have to be playing with toys either. You can get them into the kitchen and get them making pancakes with you or making a cupcake with you or, uh, you know, that, all of that sort of stuff. The water play out the back, the sand pit, uh, all of those kinds of things are going to give you exactly the same kinds of uh, opportunities for your children to experience play. Yeah. Well, this has been a really robust chat today. I've had an absolute ball. If you were maybe just to summarise some of the key messages that we've um, sort of spoken about today for anyone watching or listening, what would they be? Uh, number one, play with your kids. Number two, let your children guide the play to the extent that it's reasonable and that you've got the patience and capacity. Uh, number three, make sure they've got toys because toys are associated with really strong developmental outcomes and school readiness and uh, our children's well-being. It's, it's important. Beyond that, though, I think we just want to create the space, physical space, but also time space to facilitate play and access to those resources where our children can be kids. You know, play is what children are supposed to do. Play is their work. And when we deprive them of play, they simply don't have the same developmental progress and opportunity that those children who are playing receive. Wonderful advice. Dr. Justin Coulson, it's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you so much for your time and I really hope for the opportunity to have a chat with you again in the not too distant future. Take care and thank you again. Rachel, it's been a delight. Thanks for chatting. Okay, take care. Bye.